we are not out of the woods yet. We could have another wave. We don't know whether it will be by Omicron or another new variant. As you see, we have had Alpha, Beta, Delta, Delta Omicron now. Yes. So when you get those variants, which are basically mutations, the messenger RNA, as I've said, is a biotechnology. You can really look at where the mutation took place and you can tweak your vaccine to address that mutation. Now, for the other um, platforms of vaccines, it may actually require that you develop a complete new vaccine to deal with a variant, which of course takes time before you get registration and everything. It will take a lot of time. So messenger RNA are now the new technology for the moment and for the future. And also the other, it is easy to manufacture messenger RNA once you have the technology. Before the technology, you can't. Now, if you look at other platforms, which I call viral vector, you may need to grow proteins within a laboratory to get that thing called the spike protein. And it takes time to do that. That is why when we had crisis in India, it took a bit of time for India to start remanufacturing the vaccines. So what you're telling me is, uh, what I'm hearing, I may be understanding differently, <laughs> is that once we get this show on the road, mm. we will be able to quickly deal with variants of COVID by creating things and doing the research and everything here and then just quickly distributing it. It gives you a much easier platform to be able to address variants. And if our research and development is ahead of even the fact, then it is even much, much easier. It, it may also be important to note that um, this is the technology we are looking for even to start producing vaccines for certain diseases, where we are able to know who is this, who develops diabetes, who is going to develop a cancer, who is going to, this platform is really, really relative new. That's what I was going to, I, I'm, I'm glad you alluded to it because mm. those are one of the things I wanted to ask you. What are the chances that we would actually uh, be succeeding in terms of, um, you know, producing these mm. things? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes. Because I, I'm thinking the advantages we will have mm. in terms of whether it's mm. other diseases that we want. I want to know how a, much advantage Kenya will have. What are we gaining with this? And you've pointed that out, so I'm glad you did. But yeah. here's the question. Where are we now? I mean, we already have the nod, the go-ahead from the World ah. Health Organization. Mm. So what are we doing? What, what are the next few steps? I want to know what progress to expect and the timelines. Okay, now, two things. Of course, we are waiting for more specific um, information from the World Health Organization. But if you look at the release, it's very clear that they are keen in capacity building. Uh, first, the technological transfer. So technological transfer, they must, I, I believe they are going to link us to the people who will help us set up the, the, the production facility. That's the technological transfer. And as part of technological transfer is capacity building, is to train, is to bring people to show us how this technology works. And I, I can assure you the, the, the human resource capacity in Kenya, we are really going to get that quick and running. Now, but there's something very important, and this is the biggest challenge uh, that will have to be, to be addressed, is the whole issue of glo meeting global standards, <laughs> meeting what you call WHO pre-qualification. Vaccines are produced in highly controlled environment, and every single step must meet certain standards. Last year, you may have heard when the Aspen factory in South Africa started a production of the J and J, the actual final product had to be shipped to Belgium before it came back to Africa. Yeah. And it is the last step of fill and finish that I was talking about that did not meet certain standards before it is pre-qualified fully. So one of the things is the regulatory aspects. And regulatory means that every step is monitored so that it meets certain standards from how you handle, how you store, how you produce. And the only way to answer that is to capacity build the regulatory standards of the groups that do regulation here. So we have the Pharmacy and Poisons Board, 
we have our national quality control laboratories these are going so that the regulatory capacity is in country that we will not be waiting for people to be flown in to tell us you have now met this standard continue so we are looking forward to actually engaging the world health organization so that we come with a very clear roadmap on that capacity building um, strategy it's interesting you say it is uh, one of the biggest challenges because it's not just challenges in terms of expectations from the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. It also translates to a bigger challenge in terms of acceptance right here at home because mm -hmm. Kenyans do not believe in quality of things produced here. We have so <laughs> many shortcuts we take left, right and center. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's true. Mm -hmm. It is the absolute truth. We mm -hmm. will cut corners, look at the roads. I'm doing traffic in the morning and mm -hmm. everyone is complaining against, about Ngong Road. Mm -hmm. You take Mm -hmm. years to do a small stretch and no mm -hmm. one seems to care. Mm -hmm. That is the reality that we live in. Mm -hmm. Mercury, Sijuku, Ascari, Sijuku, yani there's <laughs> drama in everything. Do you see that as a potential challenge to convince the locals to trust what is made by the local? Uh, it is going to be a process. I agree we are, um, uh, unfortunately, that is a culture we need to shed off because it's the only way that thing that will make us move forward. Remember, the, the, the selection of Kenya is a vote of confidence on our capacity to do that. So if we don't do it right, it is going to be a big letdown for the region. And, and one of the things, um, I, I have a lot of international travel. I've actually worked across nearly... All the continents except Australia. I've been in the US, I've been in Europe, I've been in Japan, and I, I, I know the, the kind of um, confidence that the public have in what they produce. And this requires a lot of political uh, support and goodwill. Uh, it's encouraging to hear now people realizing that if we depend on importing things, then our economy will not really move forward. So and, and I think in the health sector, a lot of opportunities now exist in which local manufacturing can be a major economic driver in this country. But as you say, then, the consumer, we the Kenyans, must have the confidence. But I think what then the government does, is going to do is to ensure that regulatory environment is foolproof to give confidence to the consumer. It's interesting because you said something else that caught my attention. How South Africa had to ship the J&J &J vaccines out there to Germany in order for them to be verified and then brought back in. And that is what irks most Africans. The fact that we are so dependent on a, a, a civilization, a Western civilization that we already feel brings inequality. Uh, when it comes to distributing of vaccines. We saw that at the beginning of COVID, an uproar, complaints left, right and center, and I'm not the only one who says this. It's truly honored today to be listed as one of the beneficiary countries of the MNRA Technology Transfer Program, and this is indeed a testament to the caliber of the scientists present within our institutions across our region mm -hmm. and indeed the entire African continent. Technology transfer program, once successfully implemented, will without doubt set Africa on a sustainable path of self-sufficiency in terms of vaccine supply. Let me also say that it is my fervent desire that this collaboration will be explored also in other areas such as the manufacture of medical devices, biosimilars, and other emerging areas of biomedical research. Now, I love that everyone is looking forward to having a... Uh, being more independent in creating these vaccines. But from everything you're saying, while we get a certain sense of independence, we're still very dependent on the West in terms of the technology they'll bring to us, in terms of straining us, I'm assuming, some of them, uh, uh, in the way of usage of the technology and, of course, how to... It, and in terms of quality, because they have to check our quality time and again. Mm -hmm. How is that freedom? Uh... I, I, and will that change? I, this time round, it needs to change, and I, I, I believe it's going to change. Uh, let me say, especially when it comes to products, um, um, medicines, and other biologics that have to be used anywhere. Because even when we set up the mRNA here, actually it is going to, we are going to look beyond the African continent. It may be what is producing 
the, the raw materials that will be used to manufacture a vaccine even in Asia. We may supply Australia, we may supply. So we must meet certain global standards. And I think the issue of global standards will be best midwifed by the World Health Organization. So I think our participation within World Health Organization, trying to address the issues that you say, so that we are not, we, we, we are not like remote controlled by others, because somebody has to be neutral. Remember, many of these diseases are global, so you must have a referee who is neutral. And I think the World Health Organization is best placed to be there. And I'm happy that this technology is actually has been negotiated through the World Health Organization. Absolutely. I completely agree with you on that point. What about us? Personnel. Oh, this seems lovely and dandy, mm -hmm. but you need a workforce for it. Mm -hmm. How equipped are we in terms of trained, capable personnel? In the past few months, as the technical team that advised on the manufacturing, we actually toured a number of facilities, and I'm amazed. Let me tell you, top class. I went to ILRI. ILRI is the International Laboratory for Research in Livestock, livestock yeah. Research. It's best here. Remember, it's international, so it has a lot of, and it has Kenyans working there. We, I, I've talked about Kevavapi. We toured one um, um, a private facility that is doing what you call infusions, whose setup is very close to what you would need to produce vaccines. It's best here in Nairobi. Uh, actually, we went around to just learn uh, what we do have. And we were able to talk to some of those staff. In fact, I remember one day after a visit to one of the facilities, we just said, if we picked this person, this person, and we put them here, we have our Kenya Biovax. They have, there are those who can do production, there are those who can do, there are those who know management. I think the science is there. But as I've said, vaccines will require a lot of commercial influence. And let me give an example for it. Uh, when, when AstraZeneca came, you, you always used to hear Oxford AstraZeneca. The truth of the matter is that that vaccine was developed by Oxford University. And Oxford then sold all the rights to AstraZeneca, which is an Anglo-Swedish farm. Now you just hear of AstraZeneca. So there are people doing research and development. Then somebody has to commercialize and penetrate the global market. I think that balance is going to be very important, even as we now develop that mRNA, that it is not only for us, not only for the region, but it has to also to be globally competitive. 